Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. Uh, if you're an Emory University or a healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send me, Julie Hawkins, an email or drop a note in the chat feature. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Pamela Allen. Dr. Allen received her medical degree from the University of Florida College of Medicine in Gainesville. She completed her residency in internal medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore, and then went on to complete her fellowship in hematology oncology at Northwestern University, where she also obtained a master of science in clinical investigation. Currently, Dr. Allen is an assistant professor in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology here at Emory University. Dr. Allen specializes in treatment of hematological malignancies and treats patients here at Winship Cancer Institute. She's an attending physician in the Bone Marrow and Stem Cell Transplant Center. Dr. Allen is an active member of several professional organizations, including the American Society of Hematology, American Society of Clinical Oncology, Lymphoma Research Foundation, and Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer. In addition, Dr. Allen is a principal investigator of clinical trials, evaluating novel agents for patients with recurrent or relapsed pneumonia, excuse me, lymphoma. Welcome, Dr. Allen. Thank you so much for that introduction. And today I'm gonna to be talking about cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, improving treatment and prognostication in the current era. The goals of my talk are to describe the most common subtypes of CTCL, mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, to di discuss traditional staging, diagnostic al algorithms, and opportunities for improvement, to assess outcomes in mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome across diverse treatment regions, socioeconomic status, and understand patient and treatment risk factors for inferior outcomes, as well as to touch on some uh, up and coming areas of research. So I'm gonna start out with just a very basic question for the majority of you that don't treat um, CTCL, but, but what is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? So CTCL is a rare type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma that originates in the skin. Uh, the incidence is 2,000 cases per year, but the prevalence is much higher because this is a chronic disease in most patients. The two most common subtypes are mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, but even among mycosis fungoides, there are several additional uh, histiopathologic um, and clinical subtypes, including two that I'll touch on in this presentation, hypopigmented and transformed disease. The prognosis in CTCL is highly dependent on stage. Here you can see that for patients with early stage disease, and especially those with stage 1A, uh, the prognosis is really excellent and measured in decades compared to patients with advanced stage disease where the prognosis is poor and these patients oftentimes have a median survival of five years or less. So how do we diagnose mycosis fungoides and why is it so difficult? So I'm gonna take you through uh, the clinical pathologic algorithm for diagnosis in this disease and highlight one of my own cases um, to help you to understand some of the challenges in this disease. So when we make a diagnosis of mycosis fungoides, it's not so straightforward as just looking at a biopsy. We have to also take into account clinical characteristics. And in this disease uh, for early stage MF, that means patients have to have persistent or progressive patches and plaques, and traditionally, these are in non-sun exposed areas that have variation in shape and size. In terms of histopathologic features, here we can see these single lymphocytes along the dermal epidermal junction, rather than the sheets of cells that you might expect for other forms of lymphoma. So it is required to have a superficial lymphoid infiltrate, but additionally, patients typically will exhibit epidermotropism, which means these lymphocytes are moving up towards the epidermis without spongiosis, and there will be cytologic atypia. Additional molecular and immunophenotypic abnormalities will also help uh, characterize this diagnosis. Um, we should check a, a T cell gene rearrangement and clonality um, will help. And there's usually an aberrance in the immunophenotype. And uh, compared to B cell lymphomas, where there is a tendency to gain uh, additional protein expression, in T cell lymphoma, they actually have a loss of um, typically expressed proteins and cell surface markers. So classically, this will be loss of CD7, but you can also see just differences in what's expressed in the dermis versus the epidermis. This is called epidermal and dermal discordance. 
taking these all together, um, if a patient has an, enough points, um, they can have a diagnosis of mycosis fungoides. So now I'm gonna take you to, through one of my cases to show you in, in real life how this ends up working. Um, and just as a disclaimer, this is one of my patients and, and I did obtain consent um, to present his case, but I have changed some minor details for his privacy. So this is a 25-year-old African-American who was diagnosed with atopic dermatitis in 2010. Symptoms at the time were localized to the face, but ultimately progressed to involve the full body, including the palms and soles with hyperpigmentation. His skin disease was painful and associated with itch, with cracking and peeling. He was treated initially with cyclosporin and prednisone for dermatitis with minimal improvement on and off for several years. By the time he came to see us, this is what he looked at, like. And you can see here this keratoderma or this thickening and cracking of the skin on the, on the hands, as well as these changes on the face. And when we look at his extremities and his trunk, we see very much the same changes. So he had diffuse erythrodermic scaling rash involving greater than 90% of his total body surface area. And this was associated with weight loss and edema, as well as some inflammatory changes. So how do we work up CTCL? So typically uh, tissue is the issue. So we start with a skin biopsy. And in this disease, we often need two distinct sites. Um, we send for T-cell gene rearrangement. We also typically will send for peripheral blood for flow for most patients. And this will also be sent for T-cell gene rearrangement. We also typically will perform imaging with either a CT scan or a PET scan for patients have a, that have at least 10% body surface area involvement or any abnormalities on exam. But importantly, in differentiating this from other forms of lymphoma, bone marrow biopsy is not necessary. So is a diagnosis in advanced stage disease any easier? Well, the short answer is maybe, and I'll take you through this case um, to show you in a little bit more detail. So this is uh, this patient's initial biopsy. And the first thing that you might see is under the diagnosis line, there is no diagnosis. There is a description of some of what they're seeing in terms of a uh, psoriaform epi uh, epidermal features with intraepidermal lymphocytes, um, lymphohistiocytic infiltrate with numerous eosinophils, and to an untrained eye, this might seem to be a non-diagnostic specimen. When we take a closer look underneath, we can see that it does actually meet several of the features. So there is mention of a superficial moderate mixed inflammatory lymphocytic infiltrate, so that would get a point, uh, the dermal epidermal junction. So that means that there's epidermotropism, uh, cytologic atypia. Um, it does not have a typical immunophenotype because CD5 is diffusely positive. There is no mention of loss of CD7, but there is a clonal T cell gene rearrangement. So next we did peripheral blood flow. Um, this also demonstrated a small 1% population that had loss of CD7 and CD26, which is typical for CTCL. And a clonal gene rearrangement was detected in the blood. So in summary, um, we had repeat biopsies of more than one site that showed possible mycosis fungoides with a superficial lymphoid infiltrate, epiderm tropism, and lymphocyte atypia. The immunophenotype was not typical. However, the skin T cell gene rearrangement was positive. Peripheral blood flow showed 1% clonal population, and the T cell gene rearrangement in the blood did match the clone that was in the skin. CTs were performed and showed no lymphadenopathy. So how do we stage CTCL? So CTCL, uh, importantly, is a multi-compartment disease. So we actually have to stage each of these compartments separately. We start with the skin, which is uh, staged using a physical exam where we pay close attention to patches, plaques, tumors, and ulceration. Uh, we calculate the percent uh, body surface area, and all of these numbers together can uh, put uh, a number into an MSWAT score, which is just a tool um, to, uh, to calculate how much uh, involvement of the skin there is. 
for the blood, we do flow cytometry and T cell gene rearrangement. And to assess lymph nodes and viscera, this is a combination of uh, imaging. And if there's any abnormal or enlarged lymph nodes, these would need to be biopsied for lymph node staging. So where did our patient fall? So he had involvement of uh, greater than 80% of the skin. So he would have fallen under tumor stage T4. He had no abnormal lymph nodes no visceral involvement on imaging, and technically his blood staging was B0, which I'll get into more detail. So even though he had 1% involvement, why is he B0? So the blood staging in CTCL is a bit complicated. Patients uh, with sesary cells that are less than 5% of lymphocytes are B0, whereas patients that have greater than 5%, but an absolute cell count of less than 1,000 are B1, and patients with B2, which is Cesare syndrome, have more than 1,000 cells. Additionally, we look at blood clonality, and patients are given an A if they're non-clonal or B if they're clonal. So his blood stage would be B0B. So now I want to touch on T-cell receptor clonality. This is one of the least um, understood concepts, I would say, for T-cell lymphoma and one of the most frequently asked questions. So first of all, um, you can assess T-cell receptor clonality anywhere that you're getting a biopsy, be it skin, lymph nodes, or blood. And there are multiple methods for assessing clonality, but the most commonly used in the modern era are PCR, uh, are PCR with a Biomed 2. Uh, V-beta can also be used. This is a marker that's flow cytometry, but that is, this is not available at Emory. Importantly, for the neoplastic proliferation to be suspected, uh, the clone should be identical in multiple locations. One positive clone does not equal CTCL. So what is the relevance of low positive flow as we saw in our patient in CTCL? So in order to answer this question, we performed a retrospective study of 322 patients with early stage CTCL. We assessed flow cytometry and T cell gene rearrangements in the peripheral blood. And our primary endpoint was to correlate positivity in either T cell rearrangement or flow or dual positivity in both with survival. Uh, positive flow uh, was any detectable clonal T cell population, whether patients had B0 or B1 staging, and uh, T cell gene rearrangement included any clonal rearrangements, whereas patients that were oligoclonal or indeterminate were grouped together with negative. Among 322 patients with early stage MF in our database, 58 cases were missing T-cell gene rearrangement in the blood, and 27 cases were missing flow. Um, ultimately, 256 cases had a complete data set of both TCR and flow. Looking at our patient characteristics, there was equal distribution by age, race, and stages 1A to 2A. Importantly, when we look closely at the different parameters for blood involvement, we can say and see that in terms of B staging, only eight of these patients were stage B1, um, but there was a much higher number of patients that either had TCR positivity or flow positivity in the blood. Um, but when we combined patients that had both TCR and flow, um, that was a total of 10 cases. So we next performed a univariate analysis um, to look at the impact on overall survival. And we found that, uh, that while flow positivity by itself, um, T cell receptor positivity, and even blood stage by itself were not significant for overall survival, patients that had positivity for both TCR and flow um, did have a detriment uh, to survival compared to patients that were negative for both. And here we can see that those patients that had both positive had inferior survival compared to patients that were positive, um, uh, that were negative for both. Uh, an additional finding included that um, uh, positive flow cytometry was significant, but only in the subgroup of patients with stage 2A disease. So in summary, low level blood involvement as indicated by positive results for both T cell gene rearrangement and flow cytometry were associated with inferior overall survival in early stage CTCL. 
but positive results for one or the other were not. So flow and TCR may be more sensitive than traditional B staging for prognosis and early stage disease, and ultimately more precise measurements for blood involvement are needed. So going back to our case, um, we, in addition to staging patients, we typically will do skin swabs at diagnosis. And in this case, we found that he was positive on the skin for both Pseudomonas and Staph aureus. He was treated for super infection and on follow-up had a decrease in his white blood cell count and improvement in his albumin and his skin appeared less inflamed. He was discharged locally um, where unfortunately he was admitted a few months later with sepsis for Staph aureus. So why did this patient have Staph aureus in the skin and why did he ultimately develop bacteremia? Are there certain risk factors that we can identify? So we know that infections are a major cause of morbidity, mortality, and resource utilization among patients with CTCL. CTCL patients are particularly susceptible to cutaneous infections due to widespread disruptions in their skin barrier that you could see very clearly in this case. And in a prospective study looking at patients with CTCL who had skin swabs, 63% of them were colonized with Staph aureus. There's been additional studies that have shown that staphylococcal enterotoxin is associated with both disease origination as well as progression. And but in spite of this um, abundant evidence, there is very limited uh, data on the risks of bacteremia in patients with CTCL. So this is a retrospective analysis that we did um, for patients that were seen at Emory University over 20 years. We assessed for the presence or absence of bacteremia at any point following diagnosis. Um, bacteremia was defined as the identification of at least one microbe in the bloodstream uh, on culture. Uh, a total of 180 patients with complete follow-up were eligible and there was a total of 80 episodes of bacteremia recorded with a range of zero to 10 per patient with a median follow-up of 6.2 years. Approximately 50% of our patients were African-American and there was equal distribution between early and advanced stage. 53% of our patients received oral antibiotic prophylaxis for skin infection, uh, but this was not correlated with preventing bacteremia and 20% of our patients developed at least one episode of bacteremia during their lifetime. There were some identifiable risk factors for bacteremia. This was associated with, uh, with sex. Um, interestingly, one of the greatest risk factors was um, uh, black race. Patients with advanced stage had increased risk as well as those with invasive lines and chemotherapy, whereas patients that had consistent outpatient dermatology follow-up had a lower likelihood of developing bacteremia. Not surprisingly, uh, development of bacteremia was associated with significantly inferior survival. And then when we looked at a combination of bacteremia and stage, we can see that among early stage patients that never developed bacteremia, uh, the long-term survival was excellent um, compared to patients with advanced stage that developed bacteremia who had the worst survival. Importantly, bacteremia occurs earlier in patients with advanced stage, and this may be attributed to the fact that those patients that have uh, early stage at diagnosis might be developing subsequent episodes of bacteremia once they progress to advanced stage, but this will need to be further studied. So in summary, 20% of patients with CTCL developed bacteremia at any point in time in our analysis. Uh, bacteremia was associated with an increased risk of death in patients with CTCL, and risk factors for bacteremia included advanced stage, female gender, black race, and invasive lines, as well as chemotherapy, the latter two of which um, are potentially modifiable in some patients. Our next steps for this study are a multi-center uh, analysis assessing risk factors for bacteremia char and characterizing differences in rates, infection characteristics, and treatment outcomes um, among uh, patients, uh, particularly by racial group, to really try and understand why um, uh, Black patients in our study had such a higher uh, risk of developing bacteremia.
So going back to our case, this case was discussed at um, CTCL Tumor Board and at the time was thought uh, could be exfoliative, atopic dermatitis versus erythrotermic uh, mycosis fungoides. So we discussed the treatment options and recommended that the patient follow up locally for UV light therapy as well as oral therapy with either methotrexate or targretin. Um, we, uh, the patient lived far away, so given the logistics strains, uh, we said that uh, if he didn't improve within a couple of months, we could also consider brentuximabidotin. So what happened in between? So let's go back a little bit. Here's a patient that had initially presented with his symptoms in 2010. It took about 10 years before he finally presented at Emory. And even once he came to Emory, it took over six months before he was given a preliminary diagnosis of erythrodermic MS. Uh, soon after that, um, he developed a skin infection and was treated with antibiotics and then had bacteremia. Then he was lost to follow up for three months when he lost housing. Uh, when we reached back uh, two months later, he had resumed follow up but had still not started therapy locally. Then a few weeks later, we were notified that the patient was seen in a local emergency room for fevers and chills. At this point in time, we recommended he come to Emory for admission, workup, and treatment. Three days later, he arrived. He was found to be septic with bacteremia with a large tumor on the right lateral leg. And this is what he looked like at this point in time. So we performed a biopsy of that tumor. And here you can still see that there's not really a diagnosis in the diagnosis line, but it's a little bit more clear than the prior biopsy, where instead of these single infiltrating lymphocytes, there is a dense, uh, diffuse lymphocytic infiltrate characterized by predominantly large lymphocytes with cytologic atypia, CD30 was diffusely positive, and within their differential diagnosis, they consider mycosis fungoides with large cell transformation, which also we felt fit clinically. So what is known about large cell transformation? Uh, large cell transformation is um, a, typically a pathologic diagnosis that's defined as greater than 25% involvement of large cells in the biopsy specimen. This is associated with inferior survival of typically two to three years, depending on other risk factors. But unfortunately, the treatment and risk factors for large cell transformation are very poorly defined, and case series are including you know, 10 up to 30 patients, um, some of them noting that brentuximab may be of benefit. So what is brentuximab? So this is a CD30 drug antibody conjugate. This was studied in the phase three Alcanza trial, which was really a breakthrough for CTCL because it was one of the very first large randomized studied, uh, studies that showed benefit. This was compared to uh, methotrexate or bexarotene in patients that had CD30 positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And the results demonstrated significant improvement with brentuximab vidotin compared to either methotrexate uh, or uh, bexarotene. Importantly, just recently there was published uh, a subgroup analysis that looked by either CD30% uh, percent or by large cell transformation. On this study, there was 14 patients with large cell transformation and brentuximab vidotin was more effective uh, than the other options in patients that had large cell transformation with a median progression-free survival of 15.5 months versus 2.8 months. So what do the patients with large cell transformation look like at Emory? So we performed another uh, retrospective analysis of our subgroup of patients with large cell transformation. This included a total of 63 cases, which is actually one of the largest um, uh, single institution cohorts. We found that most patients were diagnosed with advanced stage disease at the time of their large cell transformation, and, um, and most of those patients had what we call stage 2B, which is tumor stage disease. Um, hypopigmented uh, lesions were very rarely associated, found in only 3% of cases that ultimately developed large cell transformation. The most common treatments were radiation, chemotherapy, and brentuximab vidotin. Um, 
transformation uh, occurred at a median of 2.1 years, but, but could occur from zero to 32 years from diagnosis, and the median time to treatment was 30 days. The median survival of our cohort with transformed MS was 2.3 years. And on univariate analysis, looking for uh, baseline characteristics, different treatment options, uh, the only thing that was associated with survival in our cohort was the response to first-line therapy for transformed MS. And here on the right, we can see a significant separation of the curve de depending on uh, the characterization of their response with patients having a complete response, having um, essentially 100% survival. So in summary, transformed MF remains a very poorly defined clinical entity with a poor prognosis. Predictors for transformation are not known. Treatment response was the most pred uh, important predictive marker for survival in our analysis. Um, and radiation and brintuximab are probably reasonable initial treatment options. So going back to our case, um, my patient was not able to start therapy locally, um, and in fact, his local oncologist um, said she just did not feel comfortable treating his disease at all. Um, so given his uh, continued severe disease progression, we plan to go ahead and start him on treatment with brentuximab vidotin according to the Alcanza trial. Um, treatment was started, and he received a total of 10 cycles of therapy. He had complete resolution of the tumor as well as some improvement in itch and skin symptoms. Unfortunately, following 10 cycles of therapy, he was seen in a, a local emergency room with stroke-like symptoms. He returned to the emergency room three times with recurrent symptoms and was diagnosed as having a lacunar infarct with no workup and no follow-up. We brought him urgently down to Emory, where we uh, directly admitted him to the hospital and completed a complete workup. And at that point in time, he was found to have cryptococcal meningitis. So what went wrong here? First, we need to really look at the social determinants of health, because clearly more than just his diagnosis is contributing to his difficult course. Um, this is a patient that lives over four hours away from our hospital, and that is if he had a car that he was able to drive. He has to also rely on, um, uh, on public transportation, um, and there's many other factors that, that uh, determine patients' outcomes, including health care insurance, a distance to the cancer center, as we show here, what neighborhood he lives in, income, and education level. And so now I want to shift to talk a little bit about racial disparities in CTCL. So first of all, um, this, is a, this is a hot topic, but why should we study this in CTCL? So I, I hope to show you black patients do have really distinct clinical presentations and inferior survival. Um, but as opposed to other diseases, uh, racial disparities have been extremely poorly studied in this disease due to a complete lack of racial and ethnicity data in the few prospective cohort studies that we have, and lack of representation in cl clinical trials and in sequencing studies in tumor banks. So first of all, Black patients do have these distinct presentations. There is an increased incidence. They present a median of 10 years younger with a female predominance as opposed to a male predominance uh, in Caucasian patients. They present with different stages, and they have this unique uh, presentation with hypopigmentation that's almost exclusively seen in Black patients. They also have inferior survival on multiple large U.S. national registry studies. But interestingly, in this uh, study that looked at uh, over 4,000 patients from the National Cancer Database, when they looked broadly at outcomes um, unadjusted for Black, White, and Asian patients, there was really similar outcomes in the Black and the White patients. And it actually wasn't until they did propensity matching for age, stage, treatment facility, insurance, comorbidities, and treatment modality that they found significantly inferior survival in Black compared to white patients. So what does that mean? Um, their conclusion was that maybe it was differences un in underlying biology rather than disease characteristics 
socioeconomic factors or treatments received. But there's many limitations to these uh, national uh, registry studies, including the staging um, does not really conform to ISCL staging. Um, it can be plagued by misdiagnosis because this is a very difficult diagnosis to make. Uh, there's very poorly, uh, broadly defined treatment groups, you know, just radiation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, which doesn't even make sense in this disease. And the time from symptom onset to diagnosis is also not known. Hypopigmented is almost exclusively seen in black patients and might be diagnosed early, but is the one subgroup that has excellent prognosis. So is there a lead time bias for this subgroup? So in order to study this, we wanted to look at one subgroup of CTCL, Cesare syndrome. Um, so we performed a retrospective analysis of Cesare syndrome patients seen at Emory University uh, between 1990 and 2020. This included 62 patients with Cesare syndrome. We collected data on clinical characteristics, therapy, and social determinants of health. As a refresher, Cesare syndrome uh, includes patients that have erythroderma or red skin that involves greater than 80% of their body surface area and typically have B2 blood involvement, which means they've got greater than 1,000 uh, Cesare cells. So when we look at uh, differences in treatment um, for Cesare syndrome by race, we can see that some interesting patterns emerge when we look both at um, first line as well as any line of therapy. Um, there were differences in terms of ECP, uh, where ECP seemed to be more common in Caucasian patients compared to African-American and also seemed to occur earlier on in treatment. Um, similarly with interferon, whereas histone de deacetylase inhibitors seem to be more commonly given in African-American patients, um, uh, particularly in later lines of therapy. When we look at clinical characteristics, um, we can see that there was a st st statistically significant difference in some of the baseline demographics as previously noted in terms of gender. Um, there was also uh, a trend towards significance in terms of large cell transformation with a higher rate of transformation in African-American patients. In terms of laboratory values, the LDH and hemoglobin were also um, uh, different in African-American patients with higher LDH at baseline. Importantly, the median time to, uh, from diagnosis to systemic therapy was more delayed in African-American patients. Um, there was a trend towards decreased utility of ECP, but an increased usage of HDAC inhibitors. Um, but there was no difference in terms of median time to next treatment or overall survival. And so here we can see on the left, um, there really was no difference in terms of survival. And in fact, the um, black patients might have even done slightly better. And there was also no difference in time to next treatment. Uh, but importantly, when we looked at ECP, um, ECP was less common in black patients, but also the time to ECP was significantly different. We found that the median time to ECP was five times longer in black patients with a, uh, with a median time of 38 months compared to eight months in white patients. We also looked at social determinants of health, and we found there was actually no significant difference in the type of insurance between black and white patients in our study, um, but the, there was a difference in terms of commute. So much more of our black patients lived within 10 miles from the cancer center at nearly 40% compared to only 6% of white patients. So in summary, um, there were differences um, in terms of stage and gender. Um, there was higher rates of bacteremia, um, but a shorter commute. There was some differences in treatment, but it's unclear if these were related to differences in presentation between the two groups. But ultimately, there was no difference in outcome by race. So we wondered. Uh, whether access to a major urban medical center was actually equalizing racial disparities. Um, however, even in spite of the shorter commute, black patients did have a delay in starting systemic therapy and less proportional utility of ECP, and it was used in later lines of therapy. 
I'll explain more later why um, this decreased utility of ECP is particularly important. So our next question was, how can we improve treatment for all patients with Cesare syndrome? And in order to study this, um, I developed a investigator-initiated study combining two of our most active agents, mogamolizumab and extracorporeal photophoresis, or ECP, for the treatment of Cesare syndrome and erythrodermic MS, um, a phase 1b2 study. So what is ECP? Um, ECP is essentially PUVA for the blood. Uh, patients undergo leukapheresis and uh, they are exposed to a photosensitizing uh, chemotherapy in the presence of light. Um, this uh, works in two ways. Um, first, it causes direct apoptosis of Cesare cells, um, but it also causes maturation of immature dendritic uh, cells to mature dendritic cells. Patients are then reinfused with these apoptotic um, cellular debris along with the mature dendritic cells uh, to induce a secondary immune response. Uh, mogamolizumab works in a different way. So mogamolizumab is an anti-CCR4 monoclonal antibody. Um, CCR4 is highly expressed in Cesare cells. And so the first impact of mogamolizumab is uh, direct um, cytotoxicity to the CCR4 expressing uh, Cesare cells. But additionally, um, CCR4 is also expressed on T regulatory cells, which inhibit activated T cells. So by also causing ADCC of T regulatory cells, um, it allows an activated um, cytolytic response by um, T cells. So both ECP and mogamolizumab are the most effective agents that we have in Cesare syndrome and erythrodermic MS, but for different reasons. So ECP, when used early on in Cesare syndrome, is associated with improved survival, but responses are delayed and may take up to six months. Um, but in spite of that, those that have response can have responses that are durable for years. Um, ECP is also very important because it's one of the very few agents that does not uh, reduce immunity and in, in fact actually can restore uh, the immune system closer to normal. Mogamolizumab, on the other hand, um, demonstrated significantly improved response rates compared to varenostat in the phase three Maverick trial. And these responses are fast, particularly in the blood compartment, but the duration of response might be a little bit limited. So mogamolizumab is particularly effective in the skin and the blood. So our study is a single center, open label, single arm phase 1b2 study with treatment with mogamolizumab and ECP in patients with newly diagnosed Cesare syndrome or erythrodermic MF or patients that are early in their treatment course. The study was planned to consist of an initial lead-in of six patients followed by an expansion to a phase two study. And our hypothesis was that ECP and mogamolizumab would be synergistic on tumor response kinetics uh, combining the rapid response of mogamolizumab with the durability of ECP. Eligibility included patients that were uh, early on in their treatment course. They had to have less than or equal to three prior lines of systemic therapy and either B2 involvement um, or Cesare syndrome or T4 or erythroderma that were requiring systemic therapy. Patients with visceral involvement, tumor stage, or bulky lymphadenopathy, large cell transformation um, were excluded. They were allowed to have limited prior mogamolizumab or ECP. Patients are treated uh, with an induction of weekly therapy. Um, the induction period is seven weeks, followed by treatment every other week, and then a maintenance phase. Our target accrual first. Stage one is 15 patients, and for the second part is 17 patients. Response assessments for a global response score, looking at um, all disease compartments, is performed throughout therapy. And in terms of our statistical design for the first part of the study, N equals 15 patients will provide useful preliminary data on tolerability and immune response of this combination. Our primary objective uh, will be to assess toxicity during a DLT window of six weeks. Secondary endpoints include response rates um, with a best response lasting at least six months uh, calculated as well as response by disease compartment. We will also look at changes in pruritus, 
and one of the other major secondary endpoints was to look at really the feasibility of clinical trial enrollment in African-American patients and to document reasons for screen failure to see if there was a reason why um, some of our African-American patients were not receiving ECP or receiving it early in their treatment course. This is our statistical design. Um, we had 80% uh, power um, to detect a difference in overall response rate lasting at least uh, six months. We will have uh, the initial six patients for the tolerability assessment, followed by accruing an additional nine uh, patients uh, for the first uh, 15. Um, if following that, uh, patients uh, have both um, efficacious and tolerable treatment, we will proceed to the second part of the study, which will include accrual of an additional 17 patients for a total of 32 patients. Exploratory objectives include assessing biomarkers of response, changes in immunologic response on serial blood samples and peripheral blood flow cytometry using uh, Im immunologic and genomic correlatives. We will assess the correlation of baseline genomic and immunologic profiles with response and characterize specific uh, T cell populations. So where are we with this study? The study was funded um, by philanthropic funds from Winship and then has received additional support through the Concord Cancer Foundation for Correlatives and the Lymphoma Research Foundation for um, Effort. The study opened in summer of 2021. We've enrolled our first two patients and they have started therapy and a third has signed consent. So Cesare syndrome um, it is an important subtype of CTCL, but a rare one. It, it represents um, less than 5% of all CTCL. So how can we understand uh, uh, CTCL in the overall population at Emory? So in order to study this, we first looked at racial differences um, in our cohort of patients with MF and Cesare syndrome. And, we, and we, we looked back further. We included all patients that were seen between 1970 and 2020. Patients could have stage 1A up to 4B mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. And our aims were to assess whether there was racial differences in clinical features and whether or not there was difference in clinical outcomes by race. Um, we ultimately found that there was some differences that have been previously described in terms of gender and age, um, but we also found some novel associations. Um, patients had, uh, African-American patients had a higher rate of lymphadenopathy, and they were also, um, similar to what we had found previously, more likely to develop bacteremia. We also found that the time from symptom onset to diagnosis was much longer in black compared to non-black patients. But similar to what we found in our Cesare population, there was no difference in the overall population for survival by race. Some factors were associated with survival. Some of these have been previously uh, described. Um, but we, we found some novel associations. So first of all, um, as I had previously discussed, hypopigmented MF is a subtype that's almost exclusively seen in African-American patients. We found that hypopigmented MF, um, which literally just means that there's these um, hypopigmented lesions, um, and these patients had significantly improved survival compared to black or white patients without hypopigmented MF. The median survival of these patients was 100% at 10 years compared to near, uh, approximately 50%. On subset analysis, after excluding hypopigmented patients, we found that black race was associated with inferior survival, but only in the cohort of patients younger than age 60. On multivariate analysis among the non-hypopigmented cohort of patients less than age 60, race remained significant when controlling for stage and large cell transformation. So as, uh, as single center studies often do, this led to more questions than answers and led to an expansion to a multi-center cohort. Um, and so we have since uh, submitted preliminary data from our retrospective analysis of patients from six academic centers, including Emory, MD Anderson, Yale, MUSC, UAB, and Thomas Jefferson. Patients were eligible if they had a highest stage of at least 1B. This cohort included 417 patients. 
and our aims were similar in terms of assessing differences in clinical presentation, treatment, and outcomes by race. Our hypothesis was that differences in outcomes may be driven by access, um, but also that hyper hypopigmentation would be a favorable risk factor among Black patients, and that bacteremia might be increased in our Black patients as well. We found um, similar findings in terms of demographics, um, uh, lymphadenopathy, and uh, bacteremia. But similar to what we found in our uh, single center cohort, we found that survival was also no different in this multi-center cohort. So what are our next steps? Um, so this is just our preliminary analysis. Um, we have yet to perform a more detailed analysis looking at uh, treatment differences and uh, differences in time to treatment and different lines. Uh, we plan to provide an updated analysis looking at differences by rural and urban status and difference to the cancer center, as well as um, looking at uh, different rates of infection by race. So obviously there are still many ongoing gaps in knowledge. First of all, um, are, are there genomic differences as was previously suggested in one of the registry studies that might account for the different outcomes in clinical presentation in African-Americans? Um, this is a question that we are actively working on. And there have been some genomic analyses suggesting that uh, certain mutations may be associated with different subtypes of MS. But are there different mutations that might predict responsiveness to certain therapies? We noted that our African-American patients were more likely to be treated with um, HDAC inhibitors. Are there differences in the epigenetic modifiers in, in African-American compared to other patients or differences in the jack stab pathway, which is oftentimes associated with transformed MF um, and transformed uh, uh, MF is, is more common in some of our African-American patients. There's many, many uh, questions that remaining, uh, some of which we are actively working on. Um, we hope to characterize these poor outcome subgroups. We want to better understand uh, the transformed MF patients. Um, we're working on uh, describing our population that have visceral metastases, um, understanding those patients with early stage disease who progress to advanced stage if there's risk factors. Uh, we wanna understand more about disparities um, not just in race, but in socioeconomic status and differences between rural and urban uh, locations. We're interested in looking at infectious outcomes. Um, how should we be utilizing antibiotic prophylaxis? How can we decrease infectious complications? How can we simplify treatment algorithms, simplify staging, and validate prognostic markers that really move beyond just stage and basic demographics? So I wanna thank you all for your time and attention and a huge thank you um, to my mentors, uh, especially uh, Dr. Mary Jo Lekowitz, um, as well as um, other members of our Winship group and Chris Flowers, who was here previously. My collaborators, including uh, Erica Tarabagkar, Saja Asakra, uh, Ben uh, Stoff, Stephanie Pouch, my collaborators at um, Outside Institutions for the Multi-Center Study, um, the students and residents and fellows that have worked on with me uh, on many of the projects that were discussed here, our coordinators uh, and CRCs, as well as my funding sources. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Um, I see we're starting to get some questions, but if you have any questions, please try to use the Q&A box so it's easy for us to find them, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, next week, I just wanted to mention quickly that our own Jolenta Lynn will be presenting anal cancer and HIV, um, but to view any upcoming um, fall Winship Grand Rounds, um, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the website or the Winship calendar. We will continue to do these virtually. For a while, we're working on figuring out when we can return in person. Um, so I do see... Um, Dr. Langston left a couple of questions, <laughs> uh, one in the chat and one in the Q&A box. Um, among patients who received antibiotic prophylaxis and develop a bacteremia, are the bacteria generally sensitive to the prophylactics used? 
Yeah, so this is an excellent question, and this is actually something that we did um, that we did look at. Um, there was actually a significant proportion of patients that received prophylaxis that that um, when they developed bacteremia um, had resistance. And so, interestingly, you know, when we looked at the association between prophylactic use and um, development of bacteremia, there was a very strong association, um, but that probably means that we're just identifying those patients who are at high risk for bacteremia. Um, but yes, many patients that received prophylaxis um, did have um, resistance in, in the bacteremia. Uh, Dr. Ching asks, in bacteremia study, were you able to identify the specific organisms and their susceptibilities? What kind of prophylactic um, antibiotics were, were employed and how? and do they cover those organisms? Yeah, so great question. And, and I did not go into detail in terms of the, um, the types of bacteremia that we found. So the most common cause um, overwhelmingly um, was gram positives and specifically Staph aureus. The majority of these patients did have MRSA, um, but there was also um, many patients that had polymicrobial and gram negative infections. And then among uh, uh, other sources of infections, we also looked at viral, and we, we saw um, a significant number of patients that also developed um, HSV. Uh, Dr. Waller asks, what are the molecular signatures in sesary cells that confer resistance or sensitivity to PUVA and or ECP? Yeah, so great question. There's not uh, there's not a ton in terms of uh, necessarily the genomics of sesary cells that confer resistance to PUVA or ECP that I'm aware of. There have been studies that have looked at you know what patients are more sensitive, um, <clears throat> and it, it tends to be patients that have a lower uh, blood burden of disease. Um, but um, but there's no specific uh, mutational profile that seems that that has been identified. Um, Dr. Keller would like to know: Is there any role anymore for radiation? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> radiation is one of the mainstays of treatment in this disease, particularly for patients with thick plaques or tumor stage disease. And you saw in the slide that we, where we talked about transformed MF, that it's one of the most frequently used therapies in that disease. Um, and then we have a couple of questions popped up from Dr. Lawson, and I apologize if I mess up any of these words, but um, is the hypopigmentation classic vitiligo? Any thoughts on why it is a good prognostic sign? And he realizes that you have dermatologists on the team, but is there any chance some of the racial disparity is due to just not seeing it in Caucasians? Yeah, that's actually a, a really great question. So, <clears throat> so actually one of the, the, some of the emerging data for hypopigmentation and why it's such a positive sign is that actually it's thought to, to demonstrate an immune response against the CTCL, and that's why there's loss of, of hypopigmentation. So it demonstrates that they have more intact immunity. Um, so that's one reason why it's probably a good prognostic sign. The other might just be in terms of lead time bias, that if patients develop hypopigmentation, you see it sooner, and so perhaps you're able to treat it sooner. Um, Racial disparity in terms of not seeing Caucasians, that's an excellent and very important question and one that I actually discuss with my patients all the time. One thing I didn't go into detail on here is to show differences of, of how um, Sazary syndrome presents in, in pigmented or dark skin compared to lighter skin. And as you can imagine, you, red does not show up the same. Um, so patients, so dermatologists that are not used to seeing dark skin oftentimes do have um, uh, a, a delay in making that diagnosis. And I think that uh, that has come up in our study. I think by the time they get here, we're able to equalize some of those disparities, but many of these patients are seen in the community for years before they make it to here. And so I think that's why we were still able to detect that difference in time to, uh, to diagnosis from symptom onset. And uh, the last question I see is also from Dr. Lawson. Um, he says he realizes that it's T-cell lymphoma, but are there any B-cell abnormalities that might account for some of the bacteremia? Yeah, so there certainly is a complex relationship um, in CTCL with the immune system and, um, and, and uh, feedback loops that involve not just T-cells, um, but that, that also suppress um, B-cell responses. So yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Allen. This was a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it.
Um, if you missed any part of this, we do we did record this and we'll be posting it on the Grand Rounds page later today. So thank you very much for your time.